Hello everyone and welcome back to day one of theCUBE's live coverage of Google Cloud Next here in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host, Rob Strecce. Rob, there has been a dizzying number of new product announcements, new cloud announcements, updates. Yeah. It's, it's really quite, quite incredible. I, I, th I think what's awesome about it is that certain things that are old are new again. And I think one of those is what we're going to talk about here, which is hardware. And really the key components, because funny enough, even though it's called cloud, it doesn't really run in air. It runs on hardware. And I, I think again, it's getting back to those fundamentals and the use cases of it is really key. The perfect segue to introduce yes. our next guest, and that is uh, Suresh Andani. He is the yeah. Senior Director of Cloud of Product Management at AMD. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks for having me. So as Rob was just saying, hardware is really having a moment, we yep. shall say. So what, what do you make of this moment? What are you seeing out there? Just riff a little bit on that for our viewers. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a very exciting time to be a semiconductor, in the semiconductor business like we are here at AMD. Um, a lot of new use cases, and of course, uh, I would be remiss if I don't bring up generative AI and large language models. Um, the, the algorithms were there before, but we didn't have the compute power in the past collectively as an industry. But with some of the latest advancements, uh, we and our competitors also have made in the semiconductor space, they pack in more and more compute, whether it's your server CPU, or if it's your large LLM AI focused GPUs, uh, it's a very exciting time, for sure. Yeah, and I, I think what's interesting about you know, silicon be being sexy again is yeah. the fact that it's not only that, it's just it continues to grow. I mean, the density that AMD is getting on the chips, like 160 plus cores on a chip, and being able to bring that to the right place. But it's not only about CPUs, it's GPUs and the right workloads, right? I mean, yeah. what, what are the differences and what are you seeing when you're talking to customers about that? Yeah, so that's a very good question, Rob. Um, a lot of these, there's a lot of buzz around AI being run on large language models, LLMs, Gen AI, um, and everything has to be processed on a GPU. But the reality is um, there's a set of like workloads where the data set sizes are so large that literally you do need offload accelerators like our Instinct series of GPUs, the MI300, to really go do the training and inference like with the lowest latency possible. But then there's a lot of traditional foundational use cases which needs to be infused with AI, such as fraud detection, for example, for, uh, for FSI, right? Uh, or a FinTech company, or recommendation engines if you were a retailer on an e-commerce, right? And a lot of that can be actually run very efficiently uh, on CPU using CPU inferencing. Especially for edge use cases, it's, 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 it's where it's hard, where the environment does not allow to put you servers that are like multiple kilowatts per server. Uh, CPU inferencing really uh, is the right choice. So at AMD we have a customer first approach, depending on your situation, what you are optimizing for, uh, what environments you are deploying your AI hardware, uh, we try to provide the right guidance, the right infrastructure, whether it's a server CPU, like an Epic series, or if it's um, uh, an instinct GPU. So let's dive into that a little bit, because yep. that, that's interesting, this, this customer first approach where you actually talk to the customer, what are your pain points, what are you trying to solve here? Yep. Do you have any examples of, of working with customers in terms of, and then, and then the solutions that you opted for? Yeah, so um, I don't know if I can say the names publicly, but I'll, I'll kind of allude to, we have uh, the biggest uh, streaming, um, uh, video streaming and, and, and content generation company that has adopted uh, AMD instances in the cloud. And they were looking to really go and use our CPU instances, what they're using for your general video transcoding, encoding your standard workloads, but now also infusing and using the same infrastructure in the cloud to do personalization and recommendation engines for content. Another example I can give is a big global payments company uh, is using the same AMD infrastructure in the cloud to do fraud detection. Um, so again, there's like multiple customers like who are leveraging just the CPU inferencing to really achieve the end results they need to achieve. Now as they are growing, the data sets are growing, they're adding more subscribers, they're getting more feeds from their Twitter and everywhere, right? 
the data sets is increasing every day. There will be a point where to really get the right insights, you will have to do some offload uh, to the GPU uh, accelerators and we're going to be ready for that because we have, again, what we believe is, is the best hardware uh, on the GPU side to meet that. So yeah, so there, are, there are a lot of examples, exciting, real customer examples that are benefiting from our AI investments. Yeah, and I think part of it is we've been talking to Google themselves, this, and we had uh, a number of people on, Sachin was on earlier, talking about uh, Google distributed cloud, and a lot of people are going to be running that on CPUs, and not, not on GPUs because they can't, you know, they can't get GPUs for a lot, a lot of, in a lot of cases. Do you see that where, hey, as people bring AI to the data, that that is a really good use case for this? Yeah, so, Think about like a large enterprise or a SaaS provider who has all of its data already in the cloud for doing your standard workloads. You have your databases, you have all your data, you have job, all your data is already in the cloud. Now you want to kind of gain and infuse AI and gain some insights of the data that you're using to run your core foundational workloads. So it's much easier to bring AI to the data uh, through the same CPU inferencing and really get the right insights from that data. So bringing AI to the data is a motion that we are, we are seeing because your data is already in the cloud, you're already invested, you're already using the same CPU based hardware for running your foundational workloads. Just infuse AI to it. All you need to, to do is take your data, curate it, um, you're taking like regular databases to like vector databases, feeding it to the AI engines. That's a lot easier to do that than to take data to the AI. So, yeah, I mean, data has gravity for some. Data for, has a it, lot it of gravity. It definitely has gravity, so. <laughs> and, and how aware are companies, would you say, of what this, what this can do for them? In the sense of the, the content company you were just talking about, yeah. that they, they needed it for the streaming, but then also to run the recommendation engines. Yeah. Were they aware that they could extract these insights from the data, or are you also uh, alerting them, notifying them that, that, that they can do more? Yeah, so that's a good question, Rebecca. A lot of these companies, like the big ones, they are very smart engineers. They, they really were doing this for many years now. What's different now is as the hardware, as we innovate as AMD and, and bring more and more compute power to the cloud, what you can do with that data is a lot more than ever before. So if you take any content streaming app, or one of our favorite ones, if you take the same title, it's based on your history of what you have watched, it shows you a different view of the title than it shows me because of my history, because I would connect more to that, that is presentation. Wild. Wow. So that's what we call personalization. So new use cases are being enabled with the advancements in compute power. And you want to do it at very low latency and and the number of cores we pack in, the number of the amount of IO and memory bandwidth we provide that our cloud partners leverage makes it possible for those smart engineers in these end customer companies to leverage that, uh, they know exactly how to do that. Our job is to just provide them with the tools. And, and it's not only just about how powerful or how much faster they can go, there, there's the aspect of the sustainability of this because they're yeah. packing more into a smaller space. Yeah. Talk to how somebody like a Google would look to you guys and say, hey, we want to use 60% less power, I'm just pulling that out of the air, but yeah. something to that effect. Yeah, Rob, so you alluded earlier to like, AMD is now pushing 160, it's actually 192 cores oh, uh, per chip, right? And soon going to 256 cores per chip. When you have so many cores and each core performing like 25, 30% better every generation, you're packing a lot of compute power within a rack that enables you to consolidate not just the real estate in the data center, but more importantly, it helps you to consolidate the amount of wattage and the power available in the data centers. A lot of geos now are limited on how much power they can pump into a data center and how much they can cool. So the innovations we are doing from a CPU side and also on the GPU side enables much denser racks where you can consolidate a lot more processing power than you were able to do before. So it's not just solving the, hey, we are giving you more compute power, it's solving the bigger problem of data center space and power kind of limitations. 
Uh, we just had a guest on from McKinsey who has a new book out um, that is really a playbook for helping companies figure out how and when to do their pilots, what will work in a pilot, what, what the incentives, how people need to be aligned. I'm curious what you're finding when you are talking to your customers. You say you take a customer first approach, but are the business and the technologists aligned? And how are companies making space for, for AI within their technology budgets? Yeah, so that's, that's our, I don't know, I should say a million or a billion dollar question. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, a lot of us think about AI as this matrix multiplication where you're doing SIMD instructions very fast parallelly to really go do your inferencing and training. But if you think about the whole AI, it starts from data ingestion, data curation, data serving, ETL, ELT for AI, and then feeding it to the AI engine and really um, making space for that includes not just the AI, but also your, like all the database, data curation, the data pipelining, and all that ETL and ELT stuff. And the more efficiently you can do that pre-processing of the data that you feed to the AI engines, the more space and power you can allocate and make space for AI, so to speak. So a lot of, where we focused, like if you look at our general purpose CPUs, we don't pack in a lot of accelerators, hardware accelerators, just for AI, because it comes at a cost of not being able to process, do all the data pipelining and all that stuff, right? For us, like we, the, the AI would be as slow as the slowest part of that pipeline, it's Amdahl's law, right? So what, what we are trying to kind of optimize is the entire pipeline, and packing in more cores, each core being more performant than the previous gen and our competition, really the feedback we are getting from customers is the right way to go. So making space for AI through kind of helping on the foundational workloads, feeding the AI, it's a whole pipeline that, that we want to optimize, not just one piece of it through some special accelerators. So what, what is it like to work with, say, Google, and from a cloud perspective, because yeah. very different than some of your colleagues that may work with the OEMs and yep. things of that nature, where those are going off into yep. you know, data centers and being managed you know, in locally. How, how do you have to think differently about working with a hyperscaler like Google? Yeah, so uh, obviously multi-tenancy is a big kind of, not a concern, but a feature rather. Uh, so we need to make sure, A, first of all, they are renting like it's like a timeshare that they are kind of renting out to the end customers, right? So they would come in, the customers would use it, they would get out, right? And then the same hardware is being used for some other customer in a, in a different month or a different time slice. So really the architecture of like what is, we have to be, like we work very closely with Google to really every new generation we go and launch is how can they take advantage of hundreds of codes now that we are packing within one chip feeding the beast with the right amount of memory bandwidth, IO bandwidth, and really setting the, the, the TDPs off at a rack level to a point where you can still cool the infrastructure while not compromising. It's a lot of sophisticated engineering that goes behind it and we work very closely. That's just general compute. Add to that high performance computing, where now you have to have your networking to be like, uh, very fast and efficient and low jitter, low latency. And then layer on top of that, many other kind of uh, features like confidential compute we put for very regulated industries. And now very soon it becomes like uh, a pretty sophisticated infrastructure uh, where one side does not fit all. You have a different infrastructure for high performance compute, different infrastructure for general purpose compute, and now some special features like confidential compute for regulated industries. Um, so it's a, we start anywhere like between three years before the launch of the instance with, with partners like Google Cloud, and it's a journey that we take to get the best performing per per dollar instances, best features out there. Yeah, and, and we were talking beforehand, I mean there's some companies that are going down and building, you know, special purpose ASICs and things of that nature. Yeah. Uh, to me, I, 
was at a company we used FPGAs because you could reprogram them and stuff like that, but it came at a cost yeah. and they were more expensive. What is it, do you think, that, I mean, to me, it seems like CPUs and GPUs make a way more sense than purpose-built components, especially with AI. What, yeah. what are you seeing? Yeah, so generally, uh, programmable solutions like FPGAs, CPUs, GPUs, gives you the best dynamic like uh, elasticity because these, talk about AI, right? That's the talk of the town. The models are changing, the frameworks are changing. It's such an evolving area that every time you wake up in the morning, something has changed. Now, if, if you are in that dynamic world, you want to have an infrastructure that you can program from scratch and really optimize and that's where FPGAs, CPUs, and GPUs are, are amazing, right? But once your models have stabilized and, and you're like on, on your cost optimization, then in certain use cases where it's fixed, you can get into more ASIC kind of options, right? Which has its space of its own, but today in the world of AI, so much is changing on a daily basis that that's why everybody's using like CPUs for inferencing and GPUs for training and somewhere in between. I'm, I'm interested in what you just said, that thing that, and we know that this is a, an industry where there is such rapid change, really on a daily basis. We had Jamie Dimon yesterday saying that this is really, it's going to be more disruptive than the internet. Yeah. You're a technology veteran, you've been in this industry for a long time. Is that true? Is, I mean, is, is there, because part of me, I'm, I'm a future of work journalist, feels, is it a little overhyped? I mean, here we are, but, but, but at the same time, you're yeah. really in this, I'm curious. Yeah, and I get this question a lot, and there's always, there were hype cycles in the past. Uh, we all know about the dot com, and we all know about, uh, AI is not the first time we're hearing it. It came and went, and it came and went, right? Right now, why I feel it's not just a hype is we have the compute infrastructure to support the vision uh, there are use cases, you guys have all seen chat GPT, GPT-4. Um, there's always a little bit of hype into everything, right? And, and we need that to create like, but I think it's a lot more real than it is hype. Uh, as you said, I'm in the middle of talking to a lot of customers. I gave a couple of examples of how quickly these customers have leveraged uh, AI in their day-to-day -day use cases and kind of enhance their end customer experience. Um, and really the demand that we are seeing uh, is just unprecedented. Yeah. Uh, and we are kind of at the starting kind of point of that because we provide the GPUs and the CPUs. That goes into OEMs and cloud providers who sell into enterprises and digital native SaaS companies. So we are seeing the first wave of real demand which is continuing to grow. We are very excited. I'll say public things, right? When we announced our GPUs in December, we estimated about two billion sales per year, the fastest product, GPU product, to go like one billion dollars, right, for AMD. Three weeks after that, when we did our first quarter announcement, Lisa, our CEO, Dr. Lisa Su, like up that to three and a half billion dollars. Yeah. So it's kind of like, it, it, it's real, it's as real as I've seen at least. Yeah, and I, and I think it's what's neat, and I think you, you kind of hit on this, and you're part of the AI Alliance as well, which is more looking at it from an open perspective. And yeah. I, I think to me, open tends to win <laughs> yeah. from, from these things. Absolutely. And I'm sure that's what you're seeing with Google and others is that, hey, really because we're open and we can support these different workloads yeah. and we have different, and we listen to the customer and work backwards in that yeah. way, that is a big piece of why they want to work with you as well. Yeah, open sourcing of our software is a huge, huge advantage, at least that we believe in what we're hearing from our top tier one customers because it's impossible for one company in the world to have all the AI experts under one roof. So if all the innovation is happening under one roof, you're not innovating a lot. Once you open the, the whole ecosystem like we are, and it's not just our RockM software, it's yeah. everything, right? Um, our libraries, our software, um, our distros of all the, the, what do you call, the plugins and everything is all open source. And that's a huge tailwind for us that our customers are really appreciating. So yeah, that's, that's a key differentiator for us. And uh, just to answer the previous question, I think I, it, 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 it's less of a more real. I think what we need to figure out as a 
as an ecosystem, as an industry, is how would the end enterprises monetize their AI investments with their end customers, which are likely either other companies or consumers, right? So that part has to be figured out. Uh, people are seeing like the vision, but translating that to business and monetization um, is what we need to kind of, uh, so did the content company through investing in AI get more subscribers just because their interface was much more personalized? That data points need to be created to really calculate the ROI on these investments. We all believe and can feel it's there, just needs to be quantified. Right, needs to be quantified. That's yeah. a great note to end on. Thank you yeah. so much for joining us, Suresh. This is a really My great pleasure. conversation. My pleasure, Rebecca. Thank you, Rob. I'm Rebecca Knight for Rob Streche. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of Google Cloud Next. You are watching theCUBE, the leading source of enterprise news. Thank you.